Okay, well, it looks like we've got a full group, so we'll go ahead and get going. Um, so hello and welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to this Doctors for America Lunch and Learn event on pharmacy benefits managers, or more commonly known as PBMs, and their impact on the U.S. drug market. My name is Spencer AC. I will be moderating the session today. I am a rising third-year medical student at the University of Chicago, Prince School of Medicine. I've been a member of DFA since 2021, when I started leading my institution's DFA chapter. Uh, since then, I've been active in the Access to Affordable Care Impact area as a member of the Federal Legislation Subcommittee. And in just a few short weeks, I'll be wrapping up my experience with this year's uh, Jean A. Capello Health Advocacy Fellowship cohort, which has been an excellent uh, educational experience. Before we get started on our subject for today, I would like to take a quick minute to officially invite you, if you have not already, to join Doctors for America and become a contributing member. Being a DFA member today means taking the important and simple step toward selecting membership level and paying your annual membership dues to support DFA's organizational sustainability. There are six different levels to choose from, and sustaining membership includes CME for all different uh, for all advocacy grand rounds sessions attended, which can be up to 12 credits per year. A DFA team member will put a link in the chat. If you'd like to join or find out more about what that looks like, go ahead and follow that link. All right, so as I mentioned at the top, today's session will focus on pharmacy benefits managers or PBMs who have come under um, increased scrutiny in recent years. Uh, they effectively operate as middlemen in the US drug market. This is largely due to their influence on drug access and affordability, questionable business practices, and overall lack of transparency and regulation. Uh, this has prompted several, uh, several ongoing investigations into PBM activities uh, by federal agencies, congressional committees, and has also resulted in an accumulating number of bills aimed at reining in PBM influence. At DFA, we are committed to promoting accessible and affordable drugs for all patients. Unfortunately, because PBMs have historically been somewhat shrouded in mystery, many advocacy-minded healthcare providers, including some DFA members that I've spoken to, do not fully understand what PBMs are, what they do, and how they can best be regulated. So that forms the impetus for today's session, uh, which we will detail these key points and will hopefully be better prepared and equipped to engage in advocacy action in the near term as the um, pressure on PBMs continues to mount. Uh, of course, questions are welcome at any time during the session today. You can feel free to put those in the chat or use the Q&A feature. We will leave ample time at the end to discuss any questions. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce the speaker for today's session, Sarah Borland of Patients for Affordable Drugs. Sarah Kaminer Borland, MPHRN, is the Legislative and Policy Director at Patients for Affordable Drugs, or P4AD, the only national patient advocacy organization focused exclusively on lowering prescription drug prices. Prior to joining P4AD, Sarah worked as a harm reduction nurse at Boston Healthcare for the homeless, a policy fellow in the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and an ICU nurse at UNC Hospitals in Chapel Hill. She received her bachelor's degree in nursing from the University of North Carolina and her master's of public health and health policy from the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Sarah, we are very pleased to have you here today. I can't think of anybody more qualified to speak to us on these points. And of course, P4AD is an important um, partner of DFA. So with that, I will hand the reins over to you. Thank you again. Thank you, Spencer. Can everyone hear me okay? Good. Well, I'm very glad to be here and appreciate the kind introduction. Uh, like Spencer said, we have really enjoyed partnering with DFA on this issue. Uh, and I think the voice of doctors and just like the voice of patients is really needed in this topic in this whole sector because it is really overwhelmingly dominated by uh, pharmaceutical companies and PBMs, as we'll discuss today. So really glad to be here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about who P4AD is. Spencer uh, introduced it briefly, but we advocate on the federal and state level uh, for lower drug prices on behalf of a huge community in all 50 states. Um, we are very proud to be independent. Uh, we don't take any money from um, anyone who profits off the creation, supply, distribution of prescription drugs. So that's important for, for me to say we are really unbiased. And today I want to give the patient perspective, but I also tried to incorporate the provider perspective because um, if you don't already know it, I am sure many of you have interacted 
with PBMs before, uh, attempting to get your patient's medications you've prescribed and the PBM or the plan decided uh, your patient couldn't have, which is a huge issue. So hopefully I give that perspective perspective in addition to the policy overview and the patient perspective. Um, my goal is to give you a broad lay of the land on PBMs. It is just like everything else in the pharmaceutical sector, very complex. And so I'm going to leave some things out that are more in the weeds. But what I'm aiming to do is um, give you a broad overview and really dig into what different actors in the space think about this. Because uh, what you'll find is PBMs and drug companies themselves do a lot of finger pointing when it comes to drug prices, who's actually responsible for high drug prices. And so I'm going to try to give a pretty measured view of uh, who we think is responsible. And the spoiler is that it's both. Both can be true. So um, I hope folks come away from this with uh, a better understanding of those positions. So um, what we'll cover today, uh, what are PBMs? Where did they come from and how has that market evolved over the years? Um, you know, we will talk about what they do well, but then say where, you know, where did we lose uh, the sight of the goal along the way? We'll talk about that. Um, some of the finger pointing between PBMs and pharma. Um, and as Spencer alluded to, the increasing political scrutiny um, on PBMs and what can be done uh, as far as policy. And then we'll do Q&A, which I'm excited about. So let's start briefly with what are pharmacy benefit managers. So PBMs are the middlemen between drug manufacturers who set prices of drugs and insurance companies who manage benefits for their enrollees. Um, they don't just manage pharmacy benefits on behalf of insurance companies. They manage pharmacy benefits for Medicare Part D, for unions, for employers, they contract with all sorts of entities who would like to lower drug prices for their members. Um, they are the companies that decide which drugs are on formularies and what tiers they're on, which we'll dig into more. Um, so they have a lot of power when it comes to patient access. And again, I think many of you will, will understand uh, this because you've had experience with it. They provide various services. So developing and maintaining the formularies, processing claims, negotiating discounts and rebates, um, and we'll also discuss pocketing some of those discounts and rebates. So I do want to start with that whole claims processing perspective, because that's really how PBM started. Um, it was really meant to administer all of the claims for drugs. Then in the late 1990s, a lot of mergers started happening, and um, we saw less and less PBMs and an increasingly consolidated industry. In the early 2000s, when Medicare Part D was created, it was huge for the prescription drug market because there was a whole new population who had access to pharmacy benefits. And that further increased industry power and consolidation within PBMs. Now, fast forward to the year 2023, there are three major PBMs that control 80% of the market. So they are just enormous corporations with a lot of power over who gets what drugs at what prices. So these are very powerful entities. So I want to start with what they do well, because I'll give a little bit of credit where it's due before moving on to some of the criticism. So what do PBMs do well? First, there are not many entities at all in our health system that can exert downward pricing pressure on drug, on drug prices. So manufacturers have a ton of power. They get monopolies. They set prices, and we have to pay them. Um, there are really not a lot of actors. For example, until last year, Medicare did not have the authority to negotiate directly with drug companies. Um, there are not actors that can go up to drug companies and say, lower your prices or else. So it's important to note that because these are really powerful entities, they actually do have the ability to exert some downward pricing pressure against drug manufacturers. So, um, they do this for a lot of small insurance companies, and this is an important distinction because why are PBMs and insurance companies distinct? It's because there are thousands of insurance companies. It's also a consolidated market, but there are, let's say, independent small businesses who are self-insured. 
let's say they have 10 employees and they want to manage pharmacy benefits. They can't say, hey, we're going to collectively bargain with this huge PBM or this huge drug company, sorry, for lower drug prices because our negotiating power is limited to 10 covered lives or 10 covered patients. Um, and so there were so many small insurance companies who didn't have any ability to push back on drug companies that PBMs were created to kind of join their power and have this collective bargaining power. Um, and so that is something that they do well. They give small insurance companies the ability to contract with them so that they have more leverage against drug manufacturers who are unilaterally setting prices. Um, there's a lot of incentives that have changed since this. So we're going to dig into later what does it mean um, now that PBMs and big insurance companies are increasingly one and the same. So drug companies are forced to come to the table to work with PBMs because like I said, 80% of the market is controlled by three major actors. Um, and consolidation in the industry means that the PBMs actually have power to say, hey, give us a discount or else you don't have access to this enormous market within the drug pricing system. So if you don't get access to the PBM, you do not have patients to sell your drug to. Um, so we are talking about employee plans, Medicare, Medicaid. If you, as a drug company, do not come to the table to negotiate with that PBM, you are losing enormous markets. So there's a lot of um, incentive for drug companies to work with PBMs. So briefly, before I use uh, terminology, I want to define it. Um, Formulary is the same as your hospital formulary, I am sure. It is a list of drugs that are covered by your hospital. In this case, it's a list of drugs that are covered by your insurance company. Um, formularies are typically in the insurance setting divided into tiers. So these are designed to say which products are preferred and which products does the insurance company want to discourage. And um, each tier typically has a different level of cost sharing. So you may, for a preferred tier, only owe $5 copay. Whereas if you go past that tier into one that your insurance company would like to dissuade you from using, you may be exposed to coinsurance instead, which is a percentage of the price of the drug. So that could be a really steep difference um, if you do not do what your formulary says and decide to go around what they're trying to get you to do. So again, without all the perverse incentives that have come into play, you can see how insurance companies can use their formularies to decrease costs. They say, you know, here's a set of drugs for this condition. This one is very expensive. This one is has the same clinical benefit, but it's cheaper. So we're going to do everything we can to do utilization management and steer our patients to the lower cost option. That is what we hope will happen, um, which is important to note. Ideally, they steer patients to the least expensive option by making it the lowest amount of cost sharing. But in reality, because of kind of some perverse incentives, we are seeing that formularies are actually not necessarily prioritizing the lower priced options. Instead, they're doing the opposite. And we'll talk more about that in coming slides. So I just want to, for the visual learners out there, um, point out where all of this is happening in the drug pricing system. It's an incredibly convoluted system between health plans, pharmacies, wholesalers, manufacturers, all of that. This is a really helpful Commonwealth Fund um, graphic. And I just wanna zoom in on this relationship between the drug manufacturer and the pharmacy benefit manager. And you can see the PBM is sitting between the drug manufacturer and the health plan. And this red box is around this crucial interaction that we're talking about, which is negotiating formulary placement. And you'll see the green on the other side of it is the rebate. And we're gonna dig into the rebates really deep, but this is kind of the area of the drug pricing system that we are talking about. So let's talk a little bit about where we lost our way. Um, and first, we're going to talk about rebates, which is a, a buzzword when it comes to PBMs. They're very important. So these are post-sale payments made from the manufacturer to the PBM. So um, the manufacturer sets a price of $10. 
uh, the PBM negotiates a rebate of $8. Um, after the point of sale, the manufacturer mails a check to the PBM and they get that discount. Um, so this is the vehicle for those discounts that the PBM is allegedly getting on behalf of their beneficiaries. PBMs can extract rebates in exchange for this beneficial formulary placement. So I'm going to try uh, to use some examples throughout. So let's talk Xarelto and Eliquis, uh, blood thinners y'all probably work with a lot. So a uh, PBM can basically go up to Jansen, who makes Xarelto, and say, hey, if you don't give us a better rebate this year, we're going to make Eliquis the preferred tier, and we're going to bump Xarelto. And so that's kind of how they can really say, we're going to go for your rival unless you give us literally a bigger bribe, a bigger kickback. Um, on the other hand, drug companies can offer large rebates in order to get that. So uh, drug companies can say, hey, we really want you to have Eliquis. We're going to give you a bigger bribe. So you can see that there's kind of a, a um, dual direction of bribes going on. It's really important to know that drug companies and PBMs are always pointing their finger um, at each other for whose fault it is that we've got into some of these vicious cycles. So um, I made a meme because who doesn't love the Spider-Man meme, but if you are in policy circles who are discussing this debate, who's responsible for high drug prices and cost and accessibility issues, you continuously see this finger pointing. If you subscribe to any health policy newsletters, you are inundated with ads where pharma is yelling at the PBM industry and the PBM industry is yelling at pharma. They are um, fierce rivals, let's say. So PBMs say that drug companies are responsible for driving the increases in list prices, and they claim that they're passing all the rebates through to health plans. So PBMs say, hey, it's the drug companies that are actually setting prices. It's not us. You need to blame them. And when we get rebates, we're passing them all the way through to our plans. We're not pocketing anything as, as profit. These aren't bribes. We're just doing a service for the health plan that we contract with. On the other hand, drug companies are saying that PBMs actually are driving them to increase their prices because they're demanding larger and larger rebates. Um, so they say, we have to raise our prices because the PBM said last year we gave them an $8 discount. This year they want a $10 discount. So of course we had to raise our price from 10 to $12. So um, there is a lot of finger pointing uh, and you have to kind of look past the finger pointing to find out what is really going on in reality. And so I try to dig in a little to this. If you do look at disclosures from large PBMs, the large ones, they say that they are passing through 96 to 100% of rebates to the health plan or plan sponsor. Um, this is really important because uh, on its face, this seems really nice and lovely, but when we realize later that the PBMs and the plans are owned by the same company, this isn't necessarily them doing some good deed. Uh, I heard it explained recently, they're passing money from one pocket of their jeans to the other pocket of their jeans. So it's not some benevolent thing they're doing um, because they are affiliated with the health plans. Um, there is evidence that uh, list prices increase faster than rebates. So it's always important at p we always say it is always the drug company who set prices. The, the buck stops with them. But there are some troubling dynamics when it comes to PBMs. But we have seen list prices are increasing faster than rebates in some cases. Um, but it's also important to realize when we're talking about blockbuster medications that have no competitors at all, so they are still in the monopoly period of their market life, uh, PBMs have no power in those cases because drug companies, it's not a Xarelto Eliquis dynamic. There's not, you know, uh, equally equivalent options. We're talking monopoly drugs, which is a lot of these, um, you know, really high price blockbuster drugs like Humira until this year, the PBMs have no leverage because uh, there's no other competitor and they just have to pay whatever price the drug company sets. So um, I think we'll revisit this red box of what rebate pass through really means. But um, I also want to say, on the other hand, PBMs are now so powerful. They have hundreds of millions of dollars of lives they're negotiating on behalf of. Um, drug companies really do have to pay up or risk 
huge, enormous markets. Um, and it's really important to understand, and this is the one of the biggest criticisms of PBMs, all of these practices are completely secret. And I, we have no access to rebate data. Uh, we are just guessing what's going on. And uh, this is a huge issue because it's really hard to create policy solutions when you don't know what's going on behind the curtain. Are they using these rebates to lower prices or premiums for their enrollees? Or are they pocketing these as profits and CEO salaries and things like that? So the entire PBM rebate dynamic is completely secret and we really don't know what's going on behind the curtain, which is why a lot of the policy solutions we will discuss are transparency oriented. So where else have we gone wrong? I've alluded to the consolidation, all the mergers and acquisitions many times, but let's zoom in even more. First, let's talk horizontal consolidation. So this is PBMs merging and acquiring other PBMs. Um, so this is the market share. CVS Caremark has 34% of the market. Express Scripts, 24%. OptumRx, 21%. So uh, they are very dominant. This is from 2020. I believe it's increased since then. Um, and again, 80% of claims go through these big three. There are 266 Americans who have drug benefits that move through a PBM. This touches everyone. Um, and this is why they have so much negotiating power now because they are consolidated. So this is the horizontal consolidation piece. But let's talk about vertical consolidation. The three largest insurance plans own the three largest PBMs. So now we start to see some incentives shift in very troubling ways. Um, in addition, Below, so we're talking vertical consolidation, we have plans, PBMs, and then below that, we now have all the three major PBMs owning their own specialty pharmacies or affiliated with retail pharmacies. So you can see that there's potential for some self-steering behavior. If you are CVS Caremark, you might have a vested interest in steering your patients to CVS retail pharmacy or a CVS specialty pharmacy. So that's a little bit troubling, especially when you think about struggling independent pharmacies that are really cornerstones of some communities. Sometimes they're the only health provider in, in remote places or they provide that bridge to, to other care. Um, so it's uh, very critical to think about how incentives change. So initially, insurance companies had an incentive to try to get the lowest priced option to save on claims they pay out. So they're like, we want to afford we want to afford our drug claims and pocket discounts. But if they are also the ones pocketing the discounts because they own their own insurance plans, um, then they get to collect those rebates. So initially, you know, we, we talked about rebates being that mechanism for the discount and PBMs passing it all the way through to the plans. But if the plans and the PBMs are the same company, they are going to want to go after the larger rebate. And the larger rebate is associated with the more expensive drug. So now we have a flipped incentive where insurance plans, instead of going after the lowest price drug, they now have an incentive to cover the highest price drug because they get to pocket this enormous rebate. And we don't know how they're using it. They're likely using it to cross subsidize other claims outside pharmacy benefits, using it as profit, things like that. So it's really troubling. And again, for visual learners, this is a extremely troubling chart. It shows how, um, you know, CVS Caremark is uh, owned by Aetna. You have um, Optum and United, and you have Express Scripts and Cigna, and you can see the relationships with all the other major plans too. This is extremely troubling. And then below the PBMs, you see specialty pharmacies, retail pharmacies, and increasingly, they are also acquiring provider groups and giving that like point of sale, you know, CVS minute clinic uh, medical care as well. So these are all becoming just these enormous mega companies, which is a little scary. So um, just to double down on this, these are enormous corporations. In 2021, they handled more than 422 billion of gross drug revenues. Um, and again, 
I already said this before these mergers, they had a vested interest in keeping prices low. Now that interest is gone. Um, they do no longer worry about keeping costs down if it means they can get a larger rebate, which is really troubling. Um, let's talk a little bit about what this actually means in the real world. So first, let's talk about a patient scenario. Back to my trustee Zarelto Eloquist. Um, we are talking about these because they're in similar class, but these are not the same drug. In fact, uh, Eloquist in many ways has a lot of better research behind it and is better for certain indications. Um, but we were recently told a story about a patient who's prescribed Eloquist after an AFib hospital admission. They have various things going on. The PBM forces him to fail first on Xarelto because that is the preferred drug on the formulary. And it is actually uh, much worse for the indication for which it was prescribed than um, Eloquist and has a lot of risks that Eloquist would not have for this patient. So this patient can do something risky and fail first on Xarelto, um, or they can pay an enormous amount for Eloquist, or they can do what this patient did, which is literally order the drug from Canada because they didn't have a good option. But when you're doing that, when you're bypassing insurance, it's not always a great outcome because you don't progress towards your deductible. You don't hit your out-of-pocket cap. Bypassing insurance is not a, a sustainable health policy solution. Um, another example, thinking about a patient filling a chemotherapy prescription, this patient has to fill it at a specialty pharmacy owned by their PBM, even though they might prefer an independent community pharmacy in their hometown, a pharmacist they've had a relationship with for decades, things like that. And again, I recently read an article about how specialty pharmacies are really just defining what specialty drug means. Uh, there are all sorts of different definitions. Is it a refrigerated agent? Is it a chemo agent? Is it physician administered drug? They all have disparate definitions of what a specialty drug is. So PBMs could say like, oh, let's make this one a specialty drug. That way we can steer patients that way when really it's a drug that might be able to be filled at that community pharmacy. So this is really troubling because Independent pharmacies are going out of business um, because there's some self-steering happening that's really harmful to them. Um, provider implications. This is you all, physicians and other healthcare providers are spending hours or days or using the ancient machines known as fax machines to deal with PBMs, deal with insurance companies, with prior authorizations, trying to get past fail first, all of these dynamics. And it is a waste of y'all's time because you prescribe the drug for a reason. Um, and you are uh, your time is precious and you're spending a lot of time on the phone or trying to use a fax machine. And that's that's ridiculous. So a lot of implications for you all as well. Um, it is it is always it's not always what's best for the patient. Um, it is just what the insurance companies had has a vested interest in. And that's really troubling. The last bad dynamic I'm going to talk about, I'm going to more briefly touch on this is just more on these independent pharmacies. So when you're talking about three companies that dominate the market, an independent pharmacy, you know, is approached by a script, express scripts and P the PBM express scripts basically gets to dictate contract terms to independent pharmacists and independent pharmacies have to say yes, or else they're missing out on a hundred million covered lives or however many covered lives are in that area. And so it's really not a, negotiation at all when it comes to these contracts. Independent pharmacists are basically set up so that they have to say yes, even though it might be an exploitative contract where they're not getting paid what they should. And there is this one thing called spread pricing where the PBM will charge the payer more than what they're reimbursing the pharmacy and pocket the difference. And a lot of the bills I'll talk about ban spread pricing because that's a really predatory behavior. Um, and then again, there are a lot of anti-competitive tactics that happen through contracting. Um, example is Humira. This is a complex one, but there are now biosimilars on the market for Humira. But let's say Humira is $5,000 for a two-pack of pens, and the biosimilar is only $2,500 for the two-pack of pens. Um, if you're the biosimilar manufacturer trying to get on a formulary, you cannot offer as handsome of a rebate on your drug because your drug's only $2,500. 
Humira, Abby, can maybe give a $4,000 rebate on their drug, but your drug's only $2,500. How are you going to offer that rebate to get on the formulary? And unless patients are all switching to the biosimilar, it's not worth it to you as a um, PBM to lose that huge rebate on Humira because a lot of patients aren't going to want to switch from Humira. Um, and so they're, they're really having these contracts that are anti-competitive because they're saying, hey, if you cover the Humira biosimilar, our competitor, we're going to pull your rebate and you're actually going to start losing money. And these are really sketchy antitrust issues that I think the FTC is looking into, um, but they're really important. And this is why, you know, Humira biosimilars coming to market isn't this like great immediately we see relief going to patients because there are all these barriers that in the market that are not allowing market penetration of biosimilars, for example. So what now? That was a broad overview of some of the troubling incentives and dynamics. Let's talk about some of the increasing scrutiny we've referred to um, and potential policy solutions. So a lot of momentum building. Um, one big thing last year in June, the FTC, who looks into antitrust violations, anti-competitive behavior, announced that they were going to do a major inquiry into PBMs. They are well underway. It is a monster investigation, but I think it'll be really uh, headline, <laughs> headline deserving results. Um, because no one's been able to see behind the curtain. And I think we're, we're not going to like what we see. And there's going to be a lot of legislative and administrative solutions that, that we need to pursue once we see the results. Already in this Congress, uh, which is only six months along, we've seen six congressional co committees investigate PBMs or hold hearings on PBMs. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how the partisan makeup uh, works when it comes to PBM scrutiny, but um, this is just receiving overwhelming attention from Congress. This is bipartisan issue. P Republicans have always been interested in holding PBMs accountable. Um, you see Republicans in the past have not been very interested in holding drug companies accountable, but they've always pivoted and said, it's not the drug company, it's the PBM. It's not the drug company, it's the PBM. So this year, now that they have control of one chamber of Congress, we're going to them and saying, okay, we're ready. We're ready for you to reform PBMs because you've been saying it for years. Now that you have some power, let, let's see what you do. Um, so we're calling them out and calling them into action on that this year. Democrats are typically continuing to point back to drug companies as the one who set the prices, which is true. But they are increasingly, you know, legislating, introducing bills on PBMs. They understand it's, it's a, a dual fault issue. Um, and so I really think in this Congress with split chambers, Senate and Democratic control, House and Republicans, this is literally one of maybe three issues that both chambers agree on. So there is a, a very, very large possibility that something could pass into law during this Congress because it is really strongly bipartisan. So there are dozens and dozens of bills in Congress. I'm going to try to zoom in on categories and then I'll call out um, a couple committee packages. So first, we see a lot of transparency in studies, like let's have the inspector general study PBMs, let's have the governmental accountability office inspect PBMs. All of these entities are being called on to investigate PBMs. And we're very excited about the FTC investigation. We're not anti-investigations, but at some point, we know what the issues are and we've got to legislate to fix them. So while I believe in transparency, I think sunshine is good. It is it is uh, a very good solution. We at some point have to move on from investigations uh, and legislate. So we, we can have accountability and reform at the same time. Um, next category, anti-competitive behavior. So these are the bills that say you're not allowed to steer patients to a pharmacy you're affiliated with, or you're not allowed to charge an independent pharmacy more than you charge the pharmacy your own in your contracts. You got to make it an even playing field. Similar to that, banning exploitative contracts, there are a lot of bills that ban that spread pricing behavior I discussed. Um, and then last is a really intriguing area, 
uh, that is, there's not yet a bill on it. There are folks working on it. Um, the Senate Finance Committee leadership has proposed replacing rebates with fee-based structure. So the way you are paid should not be a portion of the price of a very high price drug. It should be a set fee. Um, and I think that has real potential to, to move the needle as far as some of these uh, bad dynamics. So as far as what specific committees are working on, all, uh, well, Energy and Commerce and the Senate Health Committee have both passed pretty big PBM packages. The Energy and Commerce one gets into the spread pricing ban, uh, transparency, and it has rebate pass-through language. And I think the Senate Health Committee also has this, and this is really intriguing. This is bill language that requires the PBM to pass through 100% of rebates to the plan. As a patient group and someone who understands that issue, that's a little troubling because these are now the same organizations, the same corporations. So uh, when we go to the Hill and talk about this, we say, hey, how are you all benefiting the end user when it's just, again, passing this dollar bill from one pocket of your pants to the other? This has to be required in some way to benefit patients. It can't just stop with the plan because we can see they're not doing right by patients. Um, so the Energy and Commerce and Health Committee bills are similar. Um, we wish they did more to directly help consumers. Uh, the third committee that is putting pen to paper right now is the Senate Finance Committee, and they are the ones who have proposed, hey, let's get rid of rebates and instead do a fee-based structure. And Senate Finance Committee does not have jurisdiction over the entire market. They have jurisdiction over Medicare. But what we see time and time and again is what Medicare does, the rest of the industry echoes, and they're really a leader on policy. And so I think if we got this fee-based instead of rebate-based structure in Medicare, it could really have positive effects across the industry. So briefly, I know I uh, came to talk about federal legislation, but I know some of you are involved in your state legislatures. And I just want to briefly say um, in 2020, there was a ruling called the Rutledge ruling, and it had to do with whether states were allowed to uh, regulate employer sponsored insurance. So that's one in two Americans. And there was previously a lot of precedent that said ERISA, which is the federal law that dictates how employer-sponsored health insurance works, is uh, dictates what all states can do. Um, preemption. We, we preempt what the states can do. But this Rutledge ruling said, open the door for states to regulate employer the employer-sponsored insurance market themselves. And so uh, scholars who are a lot smarter than me saw this ruling and immediately said, hey, states, we have now just opened the door for you, or the Supreme Court has opened the door for you to regulate PBMs yourself. And so those of you who pay attention to the legislature in your state may have seen an increasing number of bills that relate to PBMs because there's now this new Supreme Court ruling that said states were allowed to regulate it when before they couldn't. So pay attention to that. There's also um, state in insurance commissions are, are getting that increasing regulatory power. So, um, you know, these like state agencies that are just, you know, the state insurance commissioner, typically you don't think of them as really powerful entities, but they are very powerful. And now they're getting a little bit of authority into PBMs, which is cool. Real quickly, just to give you an idea of whether this could really happen, could we see some legislation passed this year? Um, we, Senator Schumer has indicated to, to reporters that he would like to bring a health package to the floor of the Senate this summer or this fall. Um, he has referred to it as a competition package. Others have said it will have PBMs. Um, we believe it'll have patent reforms that we're really excited about. Um, but because these Senate committees have already passed out of committee PBM reforms, we think they really could get tucked into this health package and pass out of the Senate, which is exciting. Um, the House timeline is a little bit slower, but I also think there's potential for them to actually um, send some PBM legislation to the floor on their side as well. Um, 
And real quick, I think that the dynamics of key players is very interesting um, because it is actors who we work with in the drug space who are typically on our side, and this one's a little trickier for them. Um, so first, Republicans, as I mentioned, they are all in for PBM reform. They've said this for a long time. Um, you know, we'll see if they actually uh, back up what they've been saying and, and pass something on this, but they are really in favor of PBM reform. Democrats, as I said, are excited about it. They want to keep the intention on drug companies who are the ones that set the prices, um, but they are also supportive of these reforms. Pharma is thrilled about these reforms. So if you're in DC, there are ads everywhere that are sponsored by Pharma, the trade group of the drug industry that say, PBMs are hurting patients, limiting access to patients. We have to reform them. So they are probably the biggest lobbying entity pushing for PBM reform right now, which makes for strange bedfellows when you're yeah, advocating for this. Health plans and PBMs, as you can iman imagine, not thrilled. Um, there are a lot of competing ads in DC pointing the finger back at pharma, rightfully so in many ways. Um, but it's also interesting to look at major employers and major unions because a lot of times they're actually saving money because of their PBM. They have to pay the benefits of their union members, for example, and PBMs are a tool that gives them discounts, gives them lower prices. So it's very interesting to see where employers and unions come out on this PBM issue because they actually are also providing health benefits like health plans through health plans. So um, interesting to see where, where key players are as these reforms move through Congress. Um, so Stay tuned. I think this fall there could be some movement and then next year as well there could be some movement um, and hopefully we'll we'll see some reforms. And then I think when the FTC investigation uh, concludes, which who knows how long it'll take, I'm glad they're taking their time. Um, I think we will hopefully see another burst of legislation looking at this. So that is all of my material. I'll pause now and we, I'm excited to get the q and A. I'm going to stop um, screen sharing just so I can see my chat. If that's good, Spencer. Great. That is perfect. Well, thank you so much, Sarah, for this informative presentation. You've given us a lot to think about, a lot of great points that can inform upcoming advocacy efforts, which based on what you've told us, it seems that there are going to be plenty of avenues for that going forward. Uh, but once again, thank you so much. It was certainly a tall order uh, to really summarize a very complex situation in, in just uh, you know a little over 40 minutes of presenting. So thank you so much for that. You certainly answered the call uh, for us today. Uh, as Sarah mentioned, we will now transition into the question and answer slash discussion portion of today's session. We have already received a number of fantastic questions from attendees, as well as some insightful comments, uh, people speaking from their own experience working in these spaces. Uh, I'd like to highlight just a few of those, uh, many of which really align with the information that you shared, which uh, always helpful to have additional perspectives and, and more evidence really pointing to uh, what PBMs are doing and, and what can be done to really rein them in. But uh, one thing that I didn't know that somebody mentioned in the chat that I'm sure many of you saw is that uh, the makers of OxyContin apparently paid extra large rebates to PBMs to keep the medication on formularies even after the addiction epidemic has been, had been recognized. So, you know, you did mention some of the positive aspects of PBMs and how they can contribute, um, you know, in positive ways to the market, but also really some alarming trends that we've seen as of late, and certainly that would uh, qualify as one of those alarming trends. So. Thank you for, for sharing that information. Um, we also had a comment from uh, somebody who appears to come from quite a bit of experience in this space as a medical director of health plans who mentioned that uh, PBMs, in, in his experience at least, PBMs present the prices of drugs, uh, but the payer decides which ones go on the formulary based on cost and efficacy. So it seems based on that and also what you described that there's quite a bit of variability in who's making these decisions, whether it's the insurance companies, whether it's the PBMs, uh, but certainly adds to the complexity of these dynamics and makes it all the more difficult to effectively regulate drug prices and make sure that we're moving people toward the most effective, but also the, the most cost-effective um, drug options. Um, so I will, I'm going to launch into a couple of uh, some, some really insightful and interesting questions, and we can go ahead and discuss those. Uh, the first of which 
is, you know, we, we do appreciate that you touched on some of the positive aspects of PBMs. You know, it's, it's easy to look at the headlines and to look at the messages from pharma, of which there are many. I, I get all of the uh, health policy update emails and attached to every single one is, is a message from pharma, um, you know, really uh, talking about the issues with PBMs. But uh, certainly, I can imagine some scenarios if there's enough transparency, if there's the proper regulatory mechanisms in place, uh, the influence that PBMs have in regulating drug prices can be used to uh, really lower those prices and create better outcomes. And so we had a question from an attendee, um, how are PBMs positioned to do a better job at eliminating severe drug shortages in the U.S.? Ooh, that drug shortage question is very interesting. Not my specialty. I will say I think there's um, a lot of potential for drug companies. I know a lot of the policy solutions with drug shortages relate to drug companies notifying the FDA when they're close to a shortage so that they uh, can make other plans like contract with another manufacturer to make sure there's not a shortage. Um, but I do think it's it's interesting to think about scenarios where PBMs are not um, maybe buying from wholesalers or or others who are actually creating drugs, delivering drugs, things like that, adequate amounts. So uh, drug shortages are not my specialty. I do think in many ways it's a manufacturer issue and an issue of we only have one manufacturer making drugs, and if they have a supply chain issue, we're, we're out of luck. That's kind of concerning. So that's another reason uh, having more than one manufacturer can be really beneficial. But I think there could be uh, some some potential for PBMs to, to be involved in some of the drug shortage work. Yeah, excellent. Thank you so much for that question and for your insightful answer, Sarah. Um, another question, I, I mean, you did you know, really point out some very alarming trends and certainly the scrutiny on PBMs is warranted, but we do appreciate you also talking about uh, a lot of solutions that are, are going to be upcoming and certainly provide some hope that we could see some better market dynamics uh, going forward. But we do have a question from one of our attendees uh, regarding some potential solutions to PBMs. Uh, would interventions with these entities as monopolies work or do we need new legislation? Great question. Yeah, I think the FTC, that's one of their tools. They can literally break up monopolies, break up companies. And I think one thing they could look at breaking up PBMs so that maybe instead of three, we have hundreds or dozens. And we there are dozens right now, but the big three overwhelming, do, overwhelmingly dominate. Maybe we break those up or maybe we vertically break up some of these entities. We do not let health plans own PBMs. We do not let PBMs own specialty pharmacies. And there are some new PBMs who, who consider themselves disruptors who are doing that. They are pledging to say we're not affiliated with the plan, we're not affiliated with the pharmacy, and we're doing fees-based instead of rebates-based. So there are PBMs who, who are trying to disrupt this space, but there's absolutely uh, an angle for regulators, especially antitrust regulators, to, to break up PBMs. And it, it, it remains to be seen. This is a very exciting FTC. They're very ambitious and, and uh, aggressive when it comes to, to monopolies. So I think it'll be interesting to see uh, what they decide to do as far as whether they would go as far as to break up some of these. Yeah, and uh, my own follow-up question to that, Sarah, what do you think has prevented uh, the FTC and other agencies from utilizing those antitrust mechanisms in the past? Um, is it a lack of transparency, um, simply just a lack of interest uh, until recently? What do you think has been sort of the delay there? Sure, I think um, it, you know FTC changes power uh, or changes in in many ways from one president to the next. So it's a lot political. Well, this FTC came in um, and decided that this is one of the industries they wanted to take on. But absolutely, I think some of it is transparency related. We can put two and two together, look at the incentives, and say, I am sure they're doing this anti-competitive behavior, which is different from FTC. You know subpoenaing these organizations and getting emails that literally, you know, indict them <laughs> because they are uh, explicitly doing behavior that's that's harmful and harmful to consumers and, and everything. So um, I think political will and just, you know, it's it's a testimony always to patients and providers and grassroots organizers and people who have basically 
yelled about drug prices and advocated on behalf of these things that these have risen to the level of being something that's politically expedient to address and it's the right thing to do but unfortunately sometimes it has to also rise to the level of political expediency for something to get done and so we've also just seen people demanding reform and I think that is why uh, some of these entities have taken a look at PBMs that haven't previously. Understood. So um, we do have some other questions that I want to circle back to, but we have some more that are kind of along this same line of discussion. So mm -hmm. I think we, we can go ahead and continue there. But another question from um, the audience, where should we be exerting pressure on the FTC? How, how has that best uh, gone about? Is it through legislation, uh, through administrative changes, yeah. uh, pressure in, in that regard? Uh, what are your thoughts there? Yeah, so uh, before opening the investigation, FTC basically made a request for comment from entities. And so a lot of um, advocacy groups, nonprofits, patient groups, and individuals submitted comments to the FTC to say, hey, here is how PBMs are harming consumers, and here's why you should investigate them. So I think that it was a method of exerting pressure that worked because the FTC opened up this investigation. But I also think the FTC is under resourced in many ways and uh they only have the ability to make these huge investigations or or bring about these huge suits every few years or uh when it's a really compelling case they know they can win or something like that because um they have historically been under resourced and so i think there is there's appropriations literally there is also legislation that can give them a little more more freedom to to enforce some of their powers against pbm so um i think it's it's dual keep you know doing things like submitting public comments to ftc but also i think in meetings with legislators saying you know ftc has a role here uh you need to to untie their hands and and let them do more and it's interesting none of the existing bills uh a lot of them give enforcement authority to the FTC, but they haven't uh, all lived in that FTC space. And I think there's more potential to, to have bills introduced that relate to antitrust authority. Okay, well, thank you so much. That's extremely helpful. Thank you for fielding that question. Um, a little bit of follow-up on, on that as well. I mean, you've mentioned several of the bills that are uh, being, have already been written or are currently being written. I'm wondering whether patients for affordable drugs or you personally have a horse in this race, so to speak. It seems like a lot of the bills are similar, but are there any that really stick out as being potentially particularly impactful or even just provisions that you think will be uh, the most impactful um, if adopted? Sure. We think with with the patient hat on. And so I think, you know, as a as a policy expert, I really like the transparency mechanisms. I like, you know, some of the things that are related to investigations. But when you look at what is actually benefiting consumers, we'd like to see a lot more actually benefit patients. Um, but we are I would say intrigued by the bills that get at self-steering behavior, for example, like patients need choices. They need to be able to go to their trusted pharmacy of, of 10 years more than they go to maybe a retail pharmacy they've never been to. So I think um, self-steering behavior also, you know, lets drug companies charge higher prices because they know they've got that adherence to the pharmacy they want. And so I think that could lower prices for patients, but also just give them more choice. So I really like the legislation that, that gets at that. And I'm also very interested to see what the legislation does that could potentially switch rebates to fees because uh, drug companies and PBMs say like price doesn't really matter, patients pay copays or whatever, but patients who are uh, in the deductible phase of their insurance or maybe have a coinsurance, which is a percentage of the price, um, price does matter. So if a PBM is saying, hey, you have to try uh, Xarelto first before you can have Eliquis, and you don't want to do that because you're worried about risks, you have to go straight to Eliquis um, and you are paying potentially a higher price. That's because of rebate dynamics, because of that jostling for formulary position. If we got rid of those rebate dynamics and instead saw, you know, 
equally equivalent drugs were given the same position or drugs that were truly better were preference, then we could see, you know, honestly, a clinical impact on patients, but also lower costs because the price really does matter because patients don't always have, have a copay. If they choose to go around that, um, they may be exposed to the full price of the drug or a coinsurance or something like that. So um, the rebate for fee switch doesn't have like a, a direct tie to consumers, but I think the way it would change some of the incentives could potentially benefit consumers. Great. Well, thank you so much for your perspective mm -hmm. on that. That's very helpful. Uh, changing gears a little bit, a question that I think is uh, quite interesting. Uh, I'm sure that um, if not everybody, almost everybody is familiar with GoodRx and um, how great of a resource that has been for patients and providers alike. Uh, somebody's wondering how GoodRx, um, if at all, interacts with this space. That is or a great or question. Or similar companies. Like yeah, GoodRx. that's a very great question. Um, and we see a lot of companies, GoodRx, I could also touch on Mark Cuban that are trying to, to disrupt some of these dynamics, but GoodRx is essentially... Uh, doing something similar to PBMs. They're going to drug companies saying, you know, we we have access to a certain market. We provide coupons to that market. And in exchange, you'll get the prescriptions filled and have access to that. Um, and in exchange, they are purchasing the medications for a discounted price. So they are essentially kind of doing group leverage negotiation. However, when patients choose to use GoodRx or use a coupon, they are saying they're going to pay cash and bypass their insurance. So again, they're not, they pay a premium for the benefits of insurance. So anytime patients, it's more beneficial for them to bypass insurance than use insurance, then our system's not working. In addition, when you're paying cash, um, you're not progressing towards your deductible, you're not progressing towards your out-of-pocket limit, things like that. And so um, I, I'm glad GoodRx exists. You know, there, there are people who who really need that option and, and they should have that option, but it's a symptom uh, of a system that's not working very well that patients would have to bypass insurance in order to use that. Um, but I know it's useful for, for people who don't have insurance because that's really important too. So it's it's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. And I, I suppose, yes, in a perfect world, there is no necessity for companies like GoodRx mm -hmm. because, you know, really people should have access to the drugs they need regardless, uh, which unfortunately characterizes much of the resources in our society and how they're distributed. But I suppose that's a, a longer conversation for another time. <laughs> but thank you so much for your, uh, your take on that point. Mm -hmm. We are uh, just about at time here, but I do want to highlight some uh, very insightful and important comments. Uh, one of the very important aspects of this conversation um, and the timeliness of it is the fact that we are now equipped with the requisite information regarding the problems and potential solutions to really make some impact going forward. And so uh, we, you know, we've received several comments in the chat and also through the question and answer feature that, you know, DFA can certainly be levering, leveraging some of its resources and networks uh, in the form of contacting legislators, in the form of submitting public comments uh, and, and other mechanisms to really put more pressure on PBMs and ensure that these legislative mechanisms that promise to really make for a, a better and more equitable drug market are, are actually adopted and seen through. And so I'm sure that there are many ways that uh, patients for affordable drugs and DFA, it seems we're, we're certainly aligned on a lot of these key priorities. And you know, I'm certain there are, are, are impactful ways that we can continue to work together and to collaborate on these sorts of issues. So we will certainly stay in touch on, on those points. Um, unfortunately, there, there are quite a few other questions and comments that uh, unfortunately we won't have time to get to. However, Sarah will be providing her slides. Um, it looks also that somebody has asked for the, the website, mm -hmm. Patients for Affordable Drugs. We'll go ahead and put that link in the chat. But Sarah is going to provide um, her slides to us. We'll send those out uh, for everybody to be able to view. And again, the recording of this session will be posted on DFA's YouTube channel for folks to check out afterwards, to review, or to send to others who may be interested in this topic. But of course, we are going to have to stop there. Of course, feel free to reach out to uh, DFA leaders or Sarah, if you don't mind, um, if mm -hmm. you'd like to share your contact information, uh, people can reach out to Sarah with questions and comments. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great comments in the chat. Um, uh, talk about how such a good job you did, Sarah. Thank you so much for this presentation. Um, it was really great to have you and we hope for 
future collaboration going forward. Yeah. But with that, thank Good you so much, me. everybody, uh, for attending this session. We hope that it was extremely informative and helpful, and we really are confident that there will be some important movement, uh, continued movement on the PDM front going forward. Thank you.